Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the five legal cases you should know, a webinar brought to you by AIA Contract Documents. A few administrative items before we get started. You will be sent this PowerPoint and recording at the conclusion of the program. This uh, course is also registered for one AIA LU. When you registered, you uh, entered your AIA member number in the registration page. That information will be used to report your credit within two weeks. I have attendees currently muted. If you have a question, please use the question function or chat function in your right go to webinar window. And if we have time at the end of the program, we'll get to any questions that we can. Now I'm going to turn it over to uh, one of our presenters, Mike Cover, to begin the program. Mike? Thank you very much, Hasi. Um, hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, today. My name is Mike Koger. I am a staff attorney with the American Institute of Architects. Um, and we're going to be talking about five legal cases, uh, really it's five legal cases that every architect and contractor should know. Um, and I'm really excited to talk about case law because, uh, frankly, I believe that the study of case law and, and reading case law, um, and these are judicial opinions uh, rendered by judges and courts throughout the United States. I believe that's really the best way to learn and understand the law. Um, it's incredibly difficult uh, for anyone who's ever read a statute to try and understand a piece of law from reading, from reading a statute. Um, but when you read a, a case that a judge has decided, uh, a legal opinion, uh, you really get a flavor for how facts are, in, are, um, are, are overlaid with uh, the laws uh, that we have. And it gives you a better understanding and a much deeper understanding of uh, legal concepts. Um, so we're going to be talking about five uh, cases that are very important to the architecture and construction world um, and uh, over the next hour or so. Before we do that, I have to say a couple of um, legal reminders. First of all, uh, the views that myself and my co-presenters are going to be uh, espousing today uh, reflect our own views. Uh, they don't necessarily reflect the views or positions of the AIA and also um, we're not providing legal advice here. We're going to be giving you some uh, general uh, concepts uh, that you um, that may be applicable to your practice that probably will be applicable to your practice but if you have uh, particular um, questions or issues uh, regarding your own practice or regarding some dispute that you're in you'll need to contact somebody who is a attorney in your state um, like I said my name is Mike Coger uh, I work at uh, AIA national headquarters in Washington DC I work on a daily basis uh, with the AIA's contract documents um, my co-presenters uh, today, our Wolf Star. Wolf is Managing Director at Via Architecture in Seattle, Washington, um, and Donovan Olaf, who is Assistant General Counsel with HOK uh, based out of St. Louis. And while we all have um, pretty uh, varying um, differences in our backgrounds and in, in the uh, work that we do every day, one thing that we all have in common um, is all three of us work pretty closely with the AIA documents. Uh, committee in the AIA documents program. Uh, myself, I'm a staff attorney, like I said, and Wolf and Donovan are both uh, documents committee members. Um, they volunteer a great amount of time to our program um, and have really helped to make um, our program um, a lot better and through, through editing and revising our contracts um, and also um, yeah. And, and also, they have uh, been instrumental in the 2017 uh, release of our design bid build contract. So if you're familiar with the A201 and some of our owner architect agreements, you're probably reading some work that they've contributed to. So here's a quick roadmap of what we're going to be uh, talking about today. I'm first going to start talking about uh, and explain a little bit about our legal system and explain why we care about old cases. Um, and then going to talk about uh, the oldest case that we have. Um, which is almost 100 years old, which is United States versus Spearin. I'm going to turn it over to Wolf, who's going to talk about the Perini versus Great Bay Hotel and Casino case from the early 90s. Uh, Donovan is going to talk about a much more recent case, uh, Beacon Residential Community. If you've been to a continuing education seminar in the last two years, you've probably heard of the Beacon case. Um, then Wolf is also going to talk about the Chesapeake Bay Foundation versus Weyerhaeuser case, which involves a lead uh, building. Um, and also, and then finally, um, Donovan is going to talk about the Duncan versus Missouri Board for Architects case, which you will probably know 
uh, better as the Hyatt Regency collapsed in Kansas City uh, back in the 1980s. So why do we care about old cases? Uh, why is it, um, what is it about old cases that, that we keep referring back to time and time again? And what is it about our legal system uh, that, that, that encourages us to look back at old cases? Well, we get our um, legal system in America from uh, English common law. And English common law is, is really has an incredible focus on the idea um, that if one court interprets a piece of law, future and lower courts should abide by that interpretation. Um, this is an idea that we call stare decisis. Um, and it's really this, this fundamental piece of our uh, legal system uh, that, that cases with similar facts should yield similar results. So, um, you know, the most famous example of that is probably when our Supreme Court renders a decision like, um, like they have many times in the past, all lower courts uh, in, in the United States have to follow that decision. Um, and the picture that you'll see uh, on, on the screen right now is Arlen Specter um, quizzing uh, uh, the, the nominee, Just, uh, Justice John Roberts, about whether or not he would uphold um, Roe versus Wade and other um, Supreme Court precedents um, at that, you know, when he was being, when Justice John Roberts was being um, uh, evaluated by the evaluated by the Senate Judiciary Committee, and of course, John Roberts, as the great lawyer that he is, said that he will repeat it over and over again in his uh, in, in his evaluation that he believes in stare decisis and he believes in the um, ideas uh, that, that 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 the Supreme Court should be consistent in their rulings. So um, <clears throat> here's an overview of the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court, or excuse me, the U.S. court systems. Uh, on one hand, you have federal courts. On the other hand, you have state courts. They all lead up to the U.S. Um, Supreme Court. Uh, and uh, federal courts, you really have to have uh, a federal issue to get into federal courts. Um, and those federal issues can be a federal question, diversity jurisdiction, um, some kind of federal law that's in question. Um, on the other hand, you have state courts um, you really have three levels. You've got trial courts, appeals courts, and then state supreme courts. Um, and these are uh, courts that are of broad jurisdiction. You really have a lot of family law. You've got um, contracts, and particularly construction contracts, design contracts, are almost always going to fall under state courts. So the idea here is that if you are in a Florida state court, you have to follow all of the decisions, um, prior decisions, um, from your Florida Supreme um, state Supreme Court, and of course from the United States Supreme Court as well. So that's a bit of an overview of the hierarchy of our uh, uh, the court systems in the United States. I'm now going to talk a bit about uh, the United States versus Spearing case, which, if you've been in the practice of architecture or construction for a while, you've probably heard the Spearing doctrine, or you've heard something about this case uh, and its uh, applicability. Um, this is the only Supreme Court case we're going to talk about. It's by far the oldest case that we're going to talk about. And, and we continue to talk about this case um, even 100 years um, after it was decided for some pretty good reasons that I hope we'll explain here in the next handful of slides. Um, this case uh, centers on a dispute uh, from the, uh, the Brooklyn Navy Yard from a construction project at the old Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, if you are from the New York area, you're probably aware of uh, the Brooklyn Navy Yard, or at least the land that used to be the Brooklyn Navy Yard. This was a very large uh, section of Brooklyn in between the Manhattan and Williamsburg bridges just east of the East River. Um, from the early 1800s to 1966, this was one of the largest uh, and most active Navy shipbuilding yards in the country. Um, some of the most important ships in our naval history um, were built there. This slide shows uh, two sh such ships, um, both uh, that are uh, in Hawaii now. On the left, you've got the USS Missouri, and on the right, just below the waterline, is the USS Arizona, which was actually, um, of course, sunk during the um, uh, bombings at Pearl Harbor. Uh, but the USS Arizona is kind of an interesting um, piece to our particular case because it was built in the early 1900s, right about the time that a contractor named Spearin was starting to do work um, for the Navy at our Brooklyn Navy Yard. And Spearin was contracted to create a dry dock, uh, to build a dry dock at the, um, 
at, at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. The dry dock is uh, what you see in the picture. Um, it is a staging area for the construction of ships. Um, they're quite huge. There's still some of these um, visible today at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. They're not used for shipbuilding anymore, of course. Um, and one of uh, Spiran's uh, pieces of their project was actually to move an existing sewer line before they started construction on their, on their dry dock. And that sewer line bisected the site um, where the dry dock that they were supposed to construct uh, was. So the first piece that they were supposed to do was move that sewer line. The Navy gave them plans and specifications to, uh, to do that relocation of the sewer line, and they did. They followed, uh, Spear and followed the plans and specifications, moved the sewer line, and started work on uh, the dry dock itself. Um, not too long after starting their work on the dry dock, they actually, um, there was a, quite a bit of flooding in the New York area, and the sewer lines that Spear and had reconstructed uh, first and there was an incredible amount of um, flooding in the dry dock. Spearin, as a result, uh, stopped work on the project, contacted the Navy and said, we're not gonna continue to do any work until you figure out what is going to be done with these sewer lines uh, that are a menace and are endangering our employees. The Navy responded by uh, waiting a while and then eventually terminating the contract with Spearin. So that set up the dispute uh, that eventually led to our case that went all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, the U.S. Navy made a fairly convoluted argument. Uh, the U.S. Navy said, wait, Mr. Spearin, you were supposed to um, uh, examine the site and make sure it was suitable for the work and check against the plans and site conditions. Um, you were also supposed to be responsible for the entire project until the Navy accepted it as complete. It is not complete. It is uh, it's flooded, it has a broken sewer line, uh, you need to finish the project, and I'm not gonna pay you the contract balances, I'm not gonna pay you for any anticipated profit as, uh, any profit as well. Um, Spearin uh, made the argument, and of course initiated the lawsuit, um, that I built, I built the sewer line according to plans and specifications, um, and they were defective. And I followed them to the letter, and it doesn't really matter what the site conditions were beyond my work, I followed your plans and specifications, uh, and uh, and therefore um, I should be entitled to receive, um, you know, the full benefit of the bargain that I struck with the Navy, which is to get paid for the work that I performed. Now um, we call this the Spearin Doctrine, as you can imagine, because Spearin ended up winning this case. Um, I don't like to normally quote uh, from my slides, but this is incredibly uh, important uh, language from the Supreme Court. Um, and, and this is what the Supreme Court had to say about this case. If the contractor is bound to build according to plans and specifications prepared by the owner, the contractor will not be responsible for the consequences of defects in the plans and specifications. And here's probably the phrase to underline here. This responsibility of the owner is not overcome by the usual clauses requiring builders to visit the site to check the plans and to inform themselves of the requirements of the work. So there's no, um, caveating your way out of this uh, requirement to, uh, uh, to provide adequate plans and specifications. We now call this uh, the owner's implied warranty of adequacy. Um, and so every time an owner hands off a set of plans and specifications to a contractor, uh, they are also giving an implied warranty that those plans and specifications are adequate uh, for the contractor to finish their work. So why does that matter to us? Well, the Spear and Doctrine has been used in quite a number of subsequent cases um, in many different ways. We're just gonna touch on a few of those. The first thing I wanna emphasize is that this is an owner provided warranty um, to the contractor. The architect does not provide such a warranty. Uh, the architect um, in their agreements with the owner is actually gonna be providing uh, services up to their standard of care. So sometimes it is possible for there to be a gap between what the architect and the duties that the architect is providing to the owner and then from the, what the owner is then the warranty that they are providing to the contractor. Um, uh, another question that, that comes up quite a bit is does the Spear and Doctrine apply to design build projects? Um, and if you think about what your owner is giving to the design builder, the owner is actually giving um, something like a program, owner's criteria, something far less than drawings and specifications. So they're not going to be giving the same kind of spear and warranties uh, that 
uh, an owner would be in a design build bid build project. So um, keep that in mind. That's one reason owners like design build projects is because they don't have the same level of Spearin issues. Um, we saw in this case that Spearin was using this concept um, to defend really against, you know, to, to basically defend against um, Navy's assertions of the U.S. Navy and also to get their contract balances. They weren't seeking any additional money for them, delays and that kind of a thing, but there have been courts um, subsequent to the Spearin uh, decision that have allowed contractors to assert not only, um, you know, defensive claims, uh, but also to assert um, claims for additional uh, money uh, in addition to what it was uh, contemplated in the contract for delay damages and so on. So you can certainly imagine a contractor using that in that manner today. Um, that's just a quick introduction. Um, uh, probably a good place to start is uh, Spearin, since it's our most famous case. Um, but some of the more some of the cases we're going to talk about next are a little bit more interesting. And I'm going to turn it over to Wolf to talk about uh, the Perini case from the early 1990s um, that caused quite um, a lot of excitement with contractors um, uh, and damages. So, Wolf. Thank you, Mike. Um, as Mike said, I'm going to present uh, the Perini case. This case was influential in addressing consequential damages. And the case centers on the former Sands Hotel and Casino in Atlantic City. Um, Mike had introduced us, and I just want to add that um, all three of us are uh, architects. Um, and I'm the only one that's only an architect. Uh, my colleagues here are also attorneys. So this was a really great opportunity for me as a non-attorney to step back from the contractual language that I deal with in, pra in practice and here uh, through the documents committee, but to look at the cases that influence those contracts. Um, I first became aware of this particular case 20 years ago in 1997 when the new versions of the AIA documents uh, were rolled out that year. Um, as you know, 2017 is a big year because the new versions of the B101 and the uh, other uh, core documents, uh, the AIA contract documents, um, get come out. And back in 1997, that's when I first was introduced to this waiver of consequential damages um, that was a new part of the documents that year. So let's turn to the case. This is about a hotel and casino. It was built in 1980 and was called uh, the Brighton. Uh, it was named after a historic hotel that is, existed in Atlantic City at the early part of the 20th century. Um, in its new form, it was the first ground up casino in Atlantic City, but was about half the size of its competitors. Uh, it was an attempt to appeal to the high rollers in an exclusive setting. It didn't have, um, uh, it, well, it had several black marks against it from the start. It did not have uh, boardwalk access, and it did not have a visible entrance from the boardwalk, and thus really resulted in no profits in its first couple of years. It endured severe cash flow problems and low monthly revenue. It was eventually rescued by the owners of the Sands Hotel in Las Vegas, and it was rebranded as the Sands. That name endured through subsequent owners under a licensing agreement. It finally turned a profit of $8 million in 1982. Many famous performers headlined at the Sands, including Frank and the Rat Pack. In 1983, uh, the Sands contemplated a renovation to start to correct some of the those black marks, uh, one of those being its visibility from the boardwalk. The goal was to expand the gaming area, renovate the suites on the top floors for those high rollers I talked about, introduce a new food court, a new entrance, and a new glitzy glass facade to lure new customers from the boardwalk. It was $16.8 million was the budget, 
um, and that was increased to 24 million uh, through the course of design and um, cost estimating. The Perini firm was hired as the construction manager, and for that, they negotiated a $600,000 fee. The goal was for the hotel and casino to remain open during construction. So during the contract negotiations, the Sands informed Perini of how critical it was to complete by summer in order to capitalize upon the high season. In fact, the Sands said it would rather push the project to 1985 if it couldn't be completed before the 1984 summer season. Nevertheless, Perini said they could achieve the summer 1984 target and the parties agreed to a May 31, 1984 substantial completion date. Here's a simple schedule to illustrate the key dates. You can see that the agreement was signed in July of 1983. Substantial completion, which is the next line down that orangey yellow uh, rectangle, was agreed upon to be May 31, 1984, before the summer season. Although the casino and food court were complete before the uh, substantial completion date, that's the first uh, dark square uh, under there. There's three listings there, casino and food court. Um, although that was completed before the substantial completion date, the park entrance and facade that were so critical to the sands were not complete until late August, pretty much at the end of that summer season, and a four-month delay from the, what was in the contract. The, seat, the suites were not completed until mid-September, but there was an agreement that was uh, signed to allow an extension for those. The Sands filed a claim and went to an arbitration panel, which awarded the Sands $14,500,000 in damages for lost profits and Perini $300,000 for its contract balance. Perini challenged that award in New Jersey State Court. Lower courts affirmed the arbitration panel award. So let's talk about the dispute. Perini's argument that if either party had contemplated damages for lost profits, it would have been in the contract. They didn't and it wasn't. After all, their fee for this job, which was only $600,000, isn't worth a $14.5 million risk. The Sands argument was that Perini knew how important it was for the project to be done for the summer. Lost profit damages were entirely foreseeable and as the breaching party should have, made, should have to be, make the Sands whole. So, the legal question was, was it a mistake for the arbitration panel to award damages for lost profits that were not contemplated in the contract between the parties? Perini certainly thought so. Let's turn to some legal concepts from the previous century to try to understand this a little better. So on appeal, the New Jersey Supreme Court turned to Hadley versus Baxendale and a case from 1854. You remember Mike uh, talked about um, uh, stare decisis and, co and English common law. This is from that time and it really does place high value on uh, the predictability that arises from uh, studying similar you know, cases with similar facts uh, with the idea that similar facts would yield similar outcomes. So in Hadley versus Baxendale, um, we hark back to English law in the mid 1800s, which addresses direct damages and consequential damages. So again, breaking the rule about reading from the slide, um, I'll read the, case, the, the decision here. And that was that where two parties have made a contract, which one of them has broken, the damages which the other party ought to receive should be such as may fairly be considered either arising naturally, those are called direct damages, 
so according to the usual course of things, or such as may reasonably be supposed to have been in, con in the contemplation of both parties. Those are consequential damages. At the time they made the contract, as the probable, at the time they made the contract, as the probable result of the breach of it. So another way for, that helped me think about this, just to kind of bring it into the modern day and think about um, a direct damages example. So consider a situation where an architect designs a building for a manufacturer of a new technology. Due to a design defect, the building collapses under a heavy snow. It's relatively simple to figure out the direct damages associated with replacing the building and getting the manufacturer going again. But as a result of the time lost due to rebuilding the facility and getting the manufacturer back on track, another company was able to serve the market. And by the time the manufacturer is back on track, it has missed its window of opportunity and lost its market share. That loss is a consequential damage and much more difficult to quantify. So the New Jersey Supreme Court's rationale behind upholding the decision of the arbitration panel was that it essentially determined that the SANS lost profits qualified as recoverable consequential damages because they were reasonably foreseeable. In its ruling, the court focused on four key points. One, Perini was aware of the motives for the project, for instance, attracting new customers off the boardwalk. Two, Perini was aware of the SANS desire and need to be finished before the summer season began. Three, Perini knew SANS was willing to delay the project if it couldn't be completed on time, yet they agreed to the earlier date. And four, Perini was well aware of the high stakes involved in the Atlantic City casino construction industry. The court was troubled by the magnitude of the award but it really had no legal basis to overturn the arbitrator's decision. Contractors, of course, were shocked as they realized the level of unpredictability of consequential damage awards, and the AIA stepped in to address this. Um, the AIA response was to uh, introduce the waiver of claims for consequential damages into the A201 general condition. That basically says that the parties have a mutual waiver of consequential damages. Um, so the owner uh, can't claim consequential damages, neither can the contractor. Why did the AIA include this? This is a tough thing to actually negotiate into a contract. I think the main reason it was to raise the issue and provide the opportunity to negotiate terms around this troubling issue. So this case is between the owner and the contractor. Why does the architect care? Architects also need to think about potential damages and how to limit them in their contract. With regard to consequential damages, could an architect find itself in the same situation as Perini? Of course. And with regard to direct damages, the Perini court was highly sympathetic to the argument that Perini's risk on the project greatly eclipsed the minimal fee it received. Can an architect make the same argument with regard to direct damages? Possibly. A common way to address this issue of proportionality is that an architect could negotiate a limit of liability. To address consequential damages in the owner-architect agreements, the AIA responded with a waiver of consequential damages clause similar to the one in A201. The idea is to keep claims limited to direct damages. So like me, you might wonder what happened to the sands? Building was imploded at 9.37 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on October 18, 2007. It was the first ever casino hotel implosion on the East Coast, and it was accompanied by a fireworks show and numerous parties along the boardwalk. It was converted to a park in 2012 and 2016 converted to a parking lot. 
Coincidentally, the Sands was demolished less than 24 hours after the death of the last surviving member of the Rat Pack, comedian Joey Bishop. Sadly, Atlantic City's dream of becoming the Las Vegas of the East Coast has never really happened. So I'm going to turn it over now to Donovan. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, every now and then a case comes along that makes the industry really sit up and take notice. Uh, the Beacon case was definitely uh, one of those. Prior to Beacon and really for the last hundred years, the architect owed a duty of care only to the architect's client. Um, as we'll see, the Beacon turned that principle on its head. To give you a little bit of background, uh, the Beacon itself is about a 600 uh, unit condo development in San Francisco. Uh, the developer hired the architects to provide engineering and architectural services. Um, the, the architects were aware that the units would be rented for uh, two years and then sold as condos. Um, buried in the architect's agreement was a little third-party beneficiary clause, and many of you have probably seen this clause. It's usually boilerplate, and essentially it says that only the parties to the agreement may enforce its terms. So uh, we'll see later on that this becomes a pretty important clause in this case. So uh, as is the, typically the case on condo projects, things didn't go as planned. Uh, the homeowners sued the architects for a laundry list of issues. Uh, chief among those was excessive solar heat gain caused by inadequate windows and a, and a, uh, a deficient or defective uh, ventilation system that did not comply with the, um, with the building code. Uh, there is actually evidence was presented at trial that the temperatures during uh, the summer months were quite excessive. So there was some legitimacy to the owner's claim. Uh, the, architect raised, the architects raised a number of defenses. The two main defenses that we're going to focus on are that of uh, lack of privity or no contract with the homeowners and no duty of, no duty of care. So basically, the architect said that, you know, I didn't sell you the condo units, homeowners, the developer sold you the, the uh, uh, condo units, therefore you should, if you are unsatisfied with them, you should sue the developer. Also, the architect said that uh, their duty of care runs to their client, the homeowners were not the client, and therefore the architects owed the homeowners nothing. The homeowners sought to impose a duty on the architect that didn't exist at law. And so to do that, they looked at other similar cases where the courts had found a duty to third parties existed. Um, on the issue of, of privity of contract, the architect or the homeowners uh, looked to products liability law. And they said, well, homes are similar to products. Um, just as a, a product manufacturer is responsible for damages caused by the product they design, uh, regardless of who purchases the product, so too should the architect be responsible for uh, deficient designs. The architect essentially designs a, a condo unit and places it into the stream of commerce and therefore you know, should be responsible in the same way a product manufacturer is responsible. On the issue of duty of care, the, the homeowners made a more compelling argument. Um, there they said that the architect should be, uh, their, their liability is very similar to the liability that an auditor has for the financial statements that the auditor prepares. So in cases where the auditor was responsible to third party investors for inaccurate or misrepresentations in financial statements, so too should our architects be responsible to homeowners for deficiencies in the designs they prepare. The trial court initially found for uh, the architects and that decision was reversed on appeal and the case landed before the California Supreme Court where uh, not surprisingly the California Supreme Court found that an architect does owe a duty of care to uh, third-party homeowners. The, 
a couple of interesting points that the, that the California Supreme Court uh, relied on. One, they said that as they, they look to the Right to Repair Act in California, which imposes a duty on architects absent a contractual relationship. And the California Supreme Court said that that was evidence that in California, there is a public policy in favor of providing homeowners with the broadest protection possible. The other issue that they pointed to um, was the, the third party ben beneficiary clause. And because foreseeability was an important element in, a, in finding any duty of care, um, they said the fact that that third party beneficiary clause was in the architect's contract indicated that the architects were aware that homeowners would be affected by, um, by their design. So uh, a couple of interesting points there. The, little boilerplate third party beneficiary clause actually played a pretty important part in this case. So what is the fallout? Uh, it's difficult to say, you know, will other cases, will other courts follow this precedent? It's possible other courts in other states will find a public policy that favors broad protections for homeowners. Uh, right now that's not been the case. Um, you know, is there liability in perpetuity? One of the defenses that the architects had raised is that, you know, if I'm liable to a homeowner, where does that end? Am I responsible to every future homeowner, no matter how many times that uh, property is sold? The answer is probably not. The statute of repose is most likely to cut off a, an architect's liability after 10 years. Um, there was evidence presented um, or it, it, some of the decisions that led to the inadequate uh, ventilation and, and the windows and the solar heat gain were the result of value engineering. And so the question here is, you know, if the owner is the architect responsible for those decisions, and the answer is possibly if the architect is the only one left standing at the end of the end of the claim. And the important um, takeaway from this is, you know, how well it's important to very to document objections very clearly, um, and of course, if those value engineering decisions violate building code, to not carry them out. Finally, how do you manage risk on a California project? SOM and HKS will probably tell you don't do condos in California. That's, um, there's a lot of condo work there, and so you know it's a very difficult issue that is being looked at. at at organizations all over the country. At HOK, we prefer a limitation of liability backed by an indemnity. The indemnity would provide protection against those third party claims. Um, indemnity is very difficult to get from clients and it's only as good as there is a party there or financial resources there to back the indemnity. So they're not perfect answers. There's not perfect solutions to these problems. The bottom line, when you do condos in California, homeowners' interests will prevail. So I'll turn it back over to Wolf. Thank you very much. So the next case um, is the Chesapeake Bay uh, Foundation versus uh, Weyerhaeuser. And this case addresses the specification of green building products. I happened to, uh, one of my first assignments when I joined the Contract Documents Committee was to work on the D503 Guide for Sustainable Projects, and subsequently I chaired the, the group that uh, developed the current guide. And this guide has influenced, and, and the research we did all influenced the uh, sustainable project documents and the uh, current recently released uh, sustainable exhibit. Um, so very important concepts that you'll see here that uh, permeate these documents. So um, this, pro this project is the Philip Merrill Environmental Center. It was built in 2001 as the headquarters of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. The foundation is a nonprofit organization devoted to the restoration and protection of the Chesapeake Bay. It was founded in 1967. This was the first building to receive LEED Platinum certification. Clark was the general contractor. Smith Group was the architect. 
It featured such things as composting toilets, rainwater retention and reuse, natural light, low energy use, geothermal wells for heating and cooling, and low VOC emitting materials, which you'll see will feature prominently in this case. I have to admit I was a little jealous of this project uh, because as an architect that got to work on uh, generally LEED certified or LEED silver project, it was so cool to see one that was going all the way to LEED platinum. Uh, remarkable project. The center is located um, directly on Chesapeake Bay near Annapolis. And the reason I show the map is just to show how exposed it is. Um, this is truly a harsh environment. The design of the project called for exposed structural wood members, both inside and outside of the building envelope. Warehouser supplied the specified parallam columns and beams. Parallams are engineered wood products that use parallel wood strands bonded together with adhesive. Using these small strands allows more efficient use of wood products that might otherwise be wasted. All wood products are susceptible to moisture, but the use of small pieces glued together increases that risk, requiring selection of moisture-resistant adhesives and protection, particularly in outdoor environments. The location on the bay makes us a particularly harsh environment, one where great care has to be taken in specifying that uh, protective element. Warehouser hired Permapost to apply a low emitting preservative that met LEED criteria. And that preservative was called PolyClear 2000. Leaks were discovered in 2001 and 2002, and rot and deterioration uh, was discovered in the late 2000s. So the dispute. Chesapeake Bay Foundation, Clark, and Smith Group entered into a settlement to remove and replace all the exterior parallels. They filed suit against, well, uh, Chesapeake Bay, Clark and Smith filed suit against Weyerhaeuser for $9.6 million. And Weyerhaeuser settled for $3.5 million and then pursued permapost in a separate action. There's no binding precedent due to the, the way that this was settled but we do have a court order on several motions that give us some clues um, to allow us to understand how to navigate uh, moving forward. So what do we know? One, no one got by unscathed. Two, PolyClear 2000 was unproven for this type of application. It was not approved by the American Wood Product Protection uh, Association. Three, all experts agreed that a better approach would have been to use a different sealant. There were other choices that were better that would have given a longer service life. And four, the court and expert witnesses didn't seem to care that PolyClear 2000 was a green product. As to the last bullet, we don't know the contracts or the understanding between the parties with regard to the PolyClear 2000 product but it seems that this product was selected primarily because it was green and lead friendly. However, in the 20 plus page court opinion, which went into a good amount of detail about the product, almost nothing was said about it being a green product or that this was an overriding factor in it being selected. There are plenty of quotes from experts stating that this wasn't the best product to use, but nothing saying that the architect, owner, or contractor weighed the idea of an untested and imperfect product against the fact that it met green criteria. What do we not know? Was the selection of PolyClear 2000 or its improper application, that was that what caused the rotten deterioration? If PolyClear 2000 was applied perfectly, would the rot and deterioration still have occurred? If so, when? Did Weyerhaeuser hold itself out as possessing specialized knowledge regarding PolyClear 2000 and its application on the specified parallel? If so, could the architect rely on Weyerhaeuser's assurances? How does the architect weigh green qualities of products against 
performance of these products. The low emitting properties were obviously important on this project. I may be reading too much into this, but as an architect, the lesson for me is that the owner may talk a lot about the importance of green design, but when it comes to litigation over a failed product, the arguments will all come down to whether this product performed. Not as compared to other green products, but compared to the entire market of products. There was no balancing of the product selection with the green goals of the project. So communication documentation is key when addressing green products that do not have a proven performance history. The D503 2013 Guide for Sustainable Projects, the SP version of the 2007 documents, and the E204 2017 Sustainability Exhibit all address this element of communication and documentation. When it comes to unproven or untested products, the D503 advises that the architect inform the owner that A, the project may require materials and equipment that have had limited testing, and B, the architect may not be able to confirm the manufacturer's representation. The guide prescribes that the architect discuss possible effects with the owner and that the owner then renders a written decision regarding use of such materials and equipment. It also prescribes that the architect is not responsible for failure of materials and equipment to perform according to manufacturer's representation. Again, as is true with much of our practice, communication is key. I'm going to turn it over to Donovan for our last case now. <clears throat> okay, uh, the Duncan case arises from the collapse of the Hyatt walkways in Kansas City in 1981. Uh, the case itself is an appeal of the decision of the Missouri Board of Architects and Professional Engineers to revoke the professional engineering licenses of the structural engineers as well as the certificate of authority of the company that employed them. Despite being nearly 30 years old, uh, there are some really relevant lessons in Duncan for our practices today. So a little bit of background, uh, the Hyatt Regency, or the Hyatt Hotel was actually built in, um, it's a 45 story hotel, opened July 1st, 1980. The owner was Crown Center Development. The structural engineers, uh, Jack Gillum was the engineer of record. Daniel Duncan was the project in engineer. GCE International employed both of them. One of the features of the hotel was an open atrium, and spanning the distance of the, of the atrium were three suspended walkways. The fourth floor walkway and the second floor walkway were suspended by the same structural system with the fourth directly above the second floor. The third floor walkway was offset and was also supported um, from the roof by a hanging rod system. Here's a picture of the uh, uh, hotel shortly after it opened. Uh, the space became very popular in the year after the hotel opened. The hotel offered what they called a Friday night tea dance, which was a 1940s style dance contest. Uh, it would attract somewhere between 1,500, <clears throat> excuse me, 1,500 and 2,000 people. So on July 17th, 1981, just over a year after the hotel opened, um, at 7.05 p.m., which was the height of one of these tea dances, the fourth floor walkway support gave way, causing it to crash onto the second floor walkway, which both then crashed onto the lobby. Um, the statistics were just astounding. Uh, 72 tons of debris crashed onto the lobby. 114 people were killed, 111 instantly or before they could be rescued. Among the dead were 18 husband-wife pairs, of course, there were over 100, 180 people uh, injured uh, beyond those that died, some of them grievously. Um, the third floor walkway, which you can see in the picture, did not collapse, uh, but was later removed due to a high probability of failure during the lifetime of the building. The National Bureau of Standards uh, rated this as, in terms of loss of life, uh, 
the most devastating structural failure in U.S. history. Depending on how you view the collapse of the World Trade Center, this is still number one or number two. Within a week, less than a week after the walkways collapse, the media around the media or outlets around the country started to report on an important change that occurred during design. You can see on the uh, uh, left hand side there, GCE's original design, which was prepared by Duncan. It called for six continuous hanger rods uh, that went from the roof through the fourth floor walkway down to the second floor walkway. During construction, Haven Steel Company, the steel fabricator, proposed changing the single rod system to a double rod system that was split at the fourth floor walkway. So instead of six continuous hanger rods, you now had um, 12 uh, split rods. The effect of this change is obvious from this graphic. The load on the washer and nut connection at the fourth floor walkway was essentially doubled. Um, the fabricator submitted shop drawings with this change to Duncan, who approved them without reviewing the structural soundness. Um, this uh, picture tells a story like no, no other can. The washer and nut connection uh, simply sheared through that box beam. And because of the lack of redundancy in the structural system, once one, once one support gave way, the entire structural system collapsed. So a lot has been said about this case over the years. There are those who think it was uh, wrongly decided, and there are those who think it didn't go far enough that criminal liability should have been found. And I don't, I'm not here to talk about the outcome of this case. What I think is really important is to focus on what the court looked at at arriving at its decision. And so to do that, I want to look at uh, three of the seven key findings in the board's decision. And that is one that Duncan and Gillum committed gross negligence, that customary practice is not a proper defense to violation of the statute, and that the engineer has a non-delegable duty of responsibility for the project to which he affixes his seal. So on the issue of gross negligence, I think it's, it's interesting to kind of read some of the facts that are relevant here. So on the issue of Duncan's gross negligence, uh, the, the court uh, cited these facts. There was evidence that the architect contacted Duncan to verify the double rod system was structurally sound. Duncan advised that it was. Uh, G however, GCE's records contain no web shear calculations of this connection. Duncan acknowledged in testimony that web shear calculations were necessary to verify structural soundness, but more importantly, GCE's own internal procedures called for a detailed check of special connections including uh, uh, shear calculations, web shear calculations. And the court went through about a page of analysis about why these are special connections. Um, Duncan claimed all of this was done, but there was no documentary evidence to, to support this claim. So the, the lacking any support of, of his um, defense, uh, the board found that he committed gross negligence. The, the board also found Gillum, the engineer of record, was vicariously liable for Duncan's acts and emissions. And vicarious liability is the type of liability that an employer has for an employee or a contractor has for a subcontractor. Um, but beyond that, the court also found Duncan was grossly negligent on um, for his own acts. And, and just, you know, the relevant facts there were that uh, during construction, about 2,700 square feet of the steel roof over the atrium had collapsed. Uh, the owner was concerned about the structural soundness of the atrium steel and paid GCE an additional fee, uh, fee to go back and, and verify their structural calculations. Gillum assured the owner that he personally reviewed every connection in the hotel. GCE's report to the architect specifically stated that Gillum had checked the suspension bridges and had found them to be satisfactory. Gillum also stated that he had found that he and another engineer had run a detailed check and thorough reanalysis of all atrium steel. 
Um, of course, there was no evidence to support this, and and the court or the board found that uh, Gillum was grossly negligent on his own by his own act. Uh, the other defense that Duncan and Gillum raised was that it was customary practice for the engineer to delegate to the steel fabricator responsibility for design of steel connections. And the court cited a couple of problems with this defense. First of all, the structural drawings did not indicate that the steel fabricator was to design these connections. The connections appeared to be completely designed. There were no um, loads or um, other information that would have been typically communicated to a fabricator indicating that it was a fabricator's responsibility to design the connection. But the court went on to say that even if the, uh, the, all of this had been done, even if the, the engineer of record had communicated an intent for the fabricator to design the connection, that did not relieve the engineer of record of his or her professional responsibility for um, those connections. So while we may have contracts and specifications that shift legal liability from one party to another, what is important here is professional responsibility does not shift. The party who delegates uh, a scope of work or responsibility for a scope of work remains professionally responsible for that scope. So the last the last point was Gillum had um, argued that uh, he should not be responsible for Duncan's gross negligence. His his argument there was that engineering is a uh, individual right and that each engineer should be individually responsible for their acts and gross negligence. And the court said um, that that is not the case. When an engineer applies affixes his or her seal to a set of drawings, that engineer assumes responsibility for the entirety of the drawing, except to the extent that it's disclaimed. So I think there's three to four big takeaways from this case that everyone should think about. Um, the first one is that having a policy and not following it is really worse than having no policy at all. So if your firm has a policy for checking connections or for doing peer review after schematic design, it's important that you follow that policy because if you, if you have the policy and you don't follow it, um, it, it looks very bad for, for, for you if there's a claim that comes up later. The other important takeaway is documentation is important, and Wolf talked about this earlier. Uh, the, act, the absence of documentation equals in a presumption that, that whatever you're claiming occurred did not occur. And so it's important to have contemporaneous written documentation of decisions and important, um, your understanding of important events. And this can be written communication, written documentation and notes. It can be confirmation emails. Uh, there's a lot of ways to do it, but it needs to be contemporaneous with, with the events as they are occurring. And finally, or, well, one other issue is that customary practice has its limits. Um, just because something is done one way doesn't mean that it will always be done that way. And in fact, if we are relying on a defense of customary practice, it's probably not the most, uh, it's probably not the best defense we can rely on. Um, if we believe that something should be done a certain way, we need to have it scoped out in our contracts and rely on that. And finally, as I said before, signing and sealing documents equals the assumption of responsibility for everything that's in the documents except to the extent that it's disclaimed. Um, so that's all I have. Um, I think we have one more slide here. And if, uh, if you have any uh, questions, there's some contact information there. And now I'll turn it over to Hasi. I'd like to thank our presenters for preparing this thoughtful and comprehensive presentation. We hope you enjoyed it. We are right at the 1.15 hour, so we will conclude today's webinar. You will be receiving the PowerPoint and the recording, and your credit will be reported directly to the AIA within two weeks. Have a wonderful afternoon.